Eh, vamos a hablar con el profesor Danny Roderick de la Universidad de Harvard y le pido al presidente Leonel Fernández a subir al escenario para hacer la entrevista y otra vez tenemos el reto de, de cumplirla en nada más 20 minutos. Como le dije, intentamos hacer lo máximo posible en, el, en esos dos días. Así que allí vamos. So we are inviting Professor Danny Roderick from Harvard University, Boston. Thank you very much. Vamos a tener que pasar al inglés ahora porque we're going to have to shift now into English because we are going to have a conversation with a distinguished economist. He is Danny Roderick, professor, Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Professor Roderick is the author of several books, including The Paradox of Globalization, Has Globalization Gone Too Far, Straight Talk on Trade, and uh, recently, he is, uh, has co-edited with Olivier Blanchard uh, a book entitled Combating Inequality, Rethinking Government's Role. So it is uh, a great honor and a pleasure to have uh, Professor Roderick with us here today to uh, discuss with us about economic inequality. And before I give him the floor, uh, I would like to quote from two references I have here that I think will illustrate what economic inequality is all about. The first one goes like this. The wealth of the world's 26 richest people is estimated to exceed the combined wealth of more than half of the rest of the world's population. Second quote, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots has reached such a level that the average employee in many companies in the US would have to work more than three, three centuries, 300 years, to earn what the average CEO can earn in a year. So I think this kind of illustrates exactly what disparities, economic inequality is all about. And uh, we'd like to hear uh, Professor Roderick, who has uh, honored us taking his time to participate in this forum on on Latin America and the Caribbean and the global stage. Professor Roderick, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. It's truly an honor. I'd like to have your take uh, about what is exactly economic uh, inequality, what are the causes, and how can we tackle that issue? Thank you very much, Bob, and good afternoon to uh, all of you. Um, I'm sorry that I cannot be with you. It's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, to have this conversation with you, uh, President Fernandez. Um, I, I'm, you asked me a very big question. Um, if you had asked me this question uh, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I would have probably given you a somewhat different answer than now. I think before the pandemic, um, global inequality. Um, seem to be moving mostly in the right direction, largely because um, uh, poor countries, countries have been doing rather well. Um, although even before the pandemic, um, it was um, um, clear to some of us that that kind of uh, rapid growth uh, in the developing countries and developing markets was not sustainable. Um, it was also the case that even in Latin America, within country, um, even though inequality remains still very high, that social policy and a number of other factors had managed to uh, result in a, in a uh, low but uh, apparent improvement uh, in uh, equality within countries. There is a reduction in equality. Um, of course, the picture in the advanced countries in the United States, in many countries, Western Europe was very different. But within, I think, in the aftermath of the pandemic, which kind of economy we're looking at uh, at, at present, um, it's it's the, the, the challenge is, is really much uh, looking much worse. Um, the developing countries and emerging markets. Um, look like um, facing significant 
uh, problems in terms of economic growth. Um, there's a significant loss of learning and capital education um, that going to leave very significant scars in the society. Um, and as we know, um, the political systems of these countries have already been under severe strain um, and um, going to be very difficult to reverse uh, the um, losses in democratic rights and quality of democratic rights that we have experienced already experienced in a number of countries. So I think we're increasingly looking at a crisis um, that is both global in terms of global inequality, the gap between rich and poor countries, uh, but also increasingly uh, a problem within countries as well that's going to be global. There is income and wealth inequality, both in developed countries and uh, developing countries. Uh, what would be the difference? I mean, why do you have such a widening gap in the US, technologically driven, and developing countries also have a, a very gap, widening gap in, in the income and, and the wealth uh, inequality? How can you differentiate what is taking place in the developed countries and why the same results we're having in, in the developing countries? What would be the cause of that? I think there's, there's been three things going on um, that sort of are, are loosely related to each other. Uh, one is um, technological change, which has not been very friendly to uh, worker and groups relatively low levels of education and skills. So technological change has favored in all countries, um, wealthier, professional, the more highly educated segments. So that has been one force pushing income and wealth inequality apart. The second force has been the deepening of economic globalization, the period of what I've called hyper globalization. Um, and I think that has um, created additional pressures in a lot of countries um, where a lot of um, production and employment opportunities in countries in manufacturing um, have disappeared. And there is a shortage of adequate well-paying jobs um, at the low end of the labor market in other countries because of intensifying global competition uh, from some major exporter. So globalization has contributed also to widening in income inequality within country. But third, and perhaps uh, most important, has been the overall roles of our policies and institutions. I think we have moved um, to an era of market fundamentalism um, with uh, increasingly uh, institutionalizing labor markets, uh, labor unions becoming significantly weaker, um, and sort of weakening labor standards. Um, and uh, thinking of inequality purely in terms of social policy and cash transfer and support for families, rather than creating broader economic opportunities, employment opportunities for larger parts of the workforce. So I think it's those, that third uh, set of causes that we need to reverse in years ahead because our policies will need to much more inclusive and much more focused on creating good jobs um, and creating ads from into the lower middle classes and middle classes uh, to those people who don't normally have uh, access to employment and good jobs. Right, but if technology has been a major cause for uh, economic inequality, looking into the future with artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, all the high-tech uh, uh, innovations that are taking place, then it seems that into the future, uh, there will is, there's going to be still a whitening gap between the rich and the poor. What, what would you say about that? I think technology comes in many different forms. I don't think it is, um, it is um, a, 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 a necessity that technological change and innovation should favor um, those who are already advantaged and more skilled. You know, when 
the Industrial Revolution first occurred was our first technological break breakthrough. Um, it was mostly um, the relatively skilled craftsmen that were adversely affected. So those initial technological improvements in uh, cotton textile technology were actually more helpful if you didn't have a lot of skills, uh, if you were not a skilled craftsman. Similarly, I think is, there's a difference today between simply labor replacing automation robots that simply um, does a job that uh, a semi-skilled or low-skilled worker can do versus many different types of innovations in digital technology that might actually um, augment, assist relatively skilled, relatively unskilled workers in the jobs that they're doing by providing them with real-time information uh, about the kinds of goods and services they're providing, enabling them to do the jobs of a more skilled profession. Um, and, and so I think we need to take a very hard look at what kind of technologies our society are incentivizing and, uh, and actively engage in the process of technological innovation to ensure that um, innovation is much more friendly to um, labor and to society at large. And I think this is something that is within our control as much as we invest in green technology, um, that is invest in the type of technology that are more friendly to the environment, climate. Um, I think we can invest in technologies that are more friendly to workers uh, rather than simply those uh, that take their jobs away. Well, I hope we can go down that path because nowadays there is a huge gap, a huge technological and cognitive gap between the developed countries and the developing countries. But looking into another matter, how can we tackle uh, economic inequality? Could it be by increasing taxes to the rich or progressive taxation, but perhaps uh, more leveling the playing field? The role of tax in, in tackling, addressing, what you have uh, referred to as the defining issue of our time, which is economic inequality. Will taxation, taxing the rich, be a solution to this? I, I think um, this is as part of the solution. It's not the full solution. I think what has happened uh, in the last 30 years or so is that um, uh, capital and corporations have become much harder to tax. Um, and therefore, the um, tax burden has shifted increasingly towards labor. And that's, of course, um, inequalizing, unequalizing. Um, and I think some of the current efforts at redressing this imbalance um, through uh, setting a minimum in corporate taxation, for example, um, goes in the right direction. Uh, however, the reason I say that this is only part of the solution is that I don't think we can permanently solve the problem of inequality simply by taxing the rich and providing transfers or more ex expanded social policies um, to um, a lower uh, and middle class. I think ultimately, the only sustainable solution to inequality is to increase productive inclusion. That is, create more productive employment uh, opportunities for to those people at the bottom of the income distribution who don't have that. Um, so it's only by increasing productivity at the bottom that means uh, supporting more and medium-sized enterprises. It means ensuring our education and training programs are much more linked to employment opportunity. Uh, it means that we make the right choices in our uh, infrastructure and spending and uh, decisions so that we are strengthening those parts of the economy and be more like, most likely to absorb labor um, rather than spending um, advantage to you. Uh, 
uh, multinationals or export-oriented large corporation. So I think ultimately um, incomes policies and, and taxing policies and, and social safety nets have to be supported by a much more productive approach that explicitly targets productivity of uh, the uh, advantaged parts of our economies. In Latin America, one of the major political problems that we have is populism. At some point, you have written that economic inequality and globalization fuel populism. Do you feel still that way about possible populism being spreading in different countries in Latin America? I think that has clearly played a role. Um, I think we see a large number of empirical studies now, um, evidence that um, it is in those parts of uh, the countries where um, economic insecurity have risen the most um, associated with whether imports, globalization, um, automation, and displacement of labor. Um, that it, on those parts of the country, Europe and the United States, um, where support for um, authoritarian uh, uh, politicians has risen the most. And I think the link is that when people feel threatened, um, when economic insecurity rises, um, I think there's a tendency, psychological tendency, to try to, um, you know, sort of look for, uh, you know, the, the culprit. It becomes easier to divide societies between us versus them, um, to point to foreigners or to corporations or to uh, immigrants uh, or um, other countries as, as the culprit and, and to, to engage in this very damaging uh, right-wing authoritarian populist uh, uh, globally. So I think economic uh, crises and economic insecurity do in, have in fact played a significant role in the rise of authoritarian populism in the last um, decade or so. Crisis, uh, back in 2008, there was a movement that took place here in the US, Occupy Wall Street, and they referred about the one uh, versus the 99%. Uh, that movement faded away uh, after, after the global financial recession kind of also faded away. But uh, would, you qual would you determine, would you identify the Occupy movement, the Wall Street Occupy movement back in 2008 as a populist movement in the US? Bueno, era una entrevista corta de todas maneras, ¿verdad? Este, lamentablemente hemos terminado abruptamente. <risa> eh, vamos a ver si el profesor entra para despedirnos. ¿eh? En todo caso, de lo que hemos conversado, sé que ha habido algunas dificultades técnicas. Es el hecho de cómo el tema de la desigualdad económica y social afecta tanto a los países desarrollados como a los países en desarrollo. Para él la causa o las causas que han determinado el tema de la inequidad económica y social básicamente es la globalización, eh, la tecnología, la revolución tecnológica y cambios institucionales. Esos son, a su modo de ver, la, los tres factores que han determinado este fenómeno. I, I was trying to explain in Spanish uh, some of your answers to my questions. Uh, so we're back. Uh, we were defining the occupied movement when the global financial crisis took place in 2008. You uh, qualify that as a populist movement also in the US. Yes, apologies for uh, disappearing on you. Um, I think every populist movement needs two things. One is it needs the pressure from below, the, the source of discontent, the sense that um, the mainstream established party uh, aren't responding uh, to these underlying um, uh, um, anxiety. I think the Occupy Wall Street movement was largely a reflection of this uh, bottom-up uh, sense of unease uh, with the establishment and their existing responses. 
But I think populism also programmatic element, something from the top, the, the, um, the, the, the parties and their programs and the populist leaders. And I think that um, came somewhat later. It was mostly the far right um, that took advantage of that. Uh, whereas it wasn't the direction was, uh, Occupy Wall Street would have gone, whether it was the one left or right. Um, uh, ultimately, it was the right wing politicians uh, that took up control of, of, of the movement, I think. Yes. Professor Roderick, we know that we have taken already very much of your very valuable time. So I do wish that uh, the next occasion we can have you in person and, and overcome those uh, technological difficulties that we sometimes have. Uh, and so we can discuss at length uh, everything related to economic uh, inequality and uh, poverty, extreme poverty, the expansion of the middle class, the role of populism, and the impact inequality has uh, everywhere in the world in different aspects of people's lives. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And, and I wish that we can have you in person next time around. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Fernandez. It's been a pleasure being with you. Gracias a ustedes.